Welcome to Machine Minds, where technology and humanity meet. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, a recruiting and search business focused on the robotics and AI industries. The Machine Minds show is where we dive deep into the intricate world of robotics and artificial intelligence. As a staffing industry leader with a passion for the frontiers of technology, I'm pleased to be bringing you intimate conversations with the founders, investors, and trailblazers who are at the heart of the AI and robotics revolution. In each episode, we dig into their journeys, the applications of the products they're working on, and the breakthroughs that are shaping our future. Join us as we explore how these machine minds are transforming the way we live, work, and understand our world. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about this amazing field, you'll learn something new with each episode. Let's delve into the extraordinary. Let's delve into machine minds. Welcome to Machine Minds. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose. Today's episode is a little different. We're about to take a short break due to upcoming conferences, training, and travel. So I wanted to use the 10th episode as a recap of the previous nine. If you haven't had a chance to go through the last nine, then this is a great starting point. You'll get a snapshot from each one, which might entice you to go back and listen to the full recording. Let's jump into it. First up, we have Daniel Drayman, Chief Product Officer from Agot AI. In this clip, Daniel talks about what Agot AI's technology does, where it's implemented, and how it helps. You know, I realized we jumped into this. I obviously am very familiar with computer vision technology, AI, and Q- QSR, as are you. But some of our listeners might not be. So if we can give like more of a, a overview or deep dive into what the technology actually does, where it is implemented in, for example, the, the line um, and how it can help impact as well. I think that would be great in layman's sure. terms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, l- l- let me t- t- take a stab at that. So computer vision is a subset of artificial intelligence, right? Which is a way for computers to perform tasks that typically were done by humans. Um, and with the use of cameras, and we use off-the-shelf, low-cost cameras, you know, call it $50 a pop. We're not looking at some type of expensive uh, equipment. Um, the cameras are placed in the restaurant, in the front of house, in the back of house, wh- wherever the use case call for them. And they are analyzing or they're, they're capturing um, the, um, you know, everything that happens in the field of view. And then we have in, in uh, the back office of each restaurant what we call an edge computer. So it's a computer that um, processes all those images, all those, the, those video feeds from the cameras locally in the restaurant. It's very important because lots of applications in artificial intelligence are done in the cloud. But to get to the cloud, you need to stream all the information to the cloud. And typically, restaurants don't have the bandwidth right. uh, to basically stream five, six, ten cameras on a continuous basis to the cloud. So you cannot do the processing off-premise. You need to do the processing in the restaurant. So that's, that's where the edge device uh, comes from. And it's a, a specialized device, you know, built for AI with uh, typically a GPU, a graphical uh, processing unit um, that crunches all those images and is able to detect things that happen in the image. So when you talk about order accuracy, um, when we program those uh, edge devices, they're able to say, okay, there's a taco here and the ingredient that was just added to the taco is black beans or pinto beans. Uh, And then by being able to understand what's in the field of view of uh, the cameras, we're able to validate that and basically to, to correlate that with the orders that are in the system. And if we see that all the tacos that have been ordered at that particular time call for pinto beans, mm-hmm. and we see that black beans went on it, we know that the wrong recipe is being used. Uh, and we're able to stop that in real time, right? And basically send a message to uh, the line cook saying, hey, no, that, that's not exactly what was ordered. You have to correct that. Um, generally speaking, this is the same technology that helps autonomous vehicles to, uh, you know, drive on, on roads. Uh, the same technologies that, um, you know, help identify all kinds of issues in CCTV, etc. But I think that we don't do that we could be doing such as facial recognition, which is another subset of uh, AI and uh, computer vision. We 
actually blur all the faces in those cases where we do have access to images. Many of our views don't capture yeah. uh, facial um, uh, features. Uh, you know, they come from above or, oh, yeah, or, or, or just, just look at the hands. Uh, but in the, those cases, uh, in the front of house, for example, right, when we analyze traffic in the restaurant, uh, everything is blurred at the source. So we, we, we don't, you know, we, we don't do anything that's related to uh, personally identifiable, uh, you know, information. Next, we have Chris Viznik, the president, and Mitchell Weiss, the chief robotics officer, both from HDS. Here they give us an overview of HDS and how they will improve the e-commerce experience with their automated combination store. HDS stands for Home Delivery Service. And uh, what we're doing on the e-commerce side of the business, we, we see huge opportunity there to improve the way groceries and merchandise is delivered to consumers at the home. And uh, what we're doing is a what we call a combination store, which is basically grocery, food, prepared foods, also general and brand name merchandise, will be able to de deliver that to consumers at store prices without any additional fee. And the way that we're able to do that is by automating the entire fulfillment process with our ro robotic fulfillment system that we call RoboFS. Uh, and, and by subsidizing the, the delivery costs the last mile by saving labor costs and all the other costs in the fulfillment process, that's how we're going to do this. And, and we really feel like it's differentiated from what's out there. Uh, the, the last mile will be our own uh, delivery service. It'll be a white glove service that can handle returns on the spot. Um, and just really a, a pleasant experience for the consumer, you know, can, compared to what is out there right now, Greg, there's just a lot of, you know, churn on that side, a lot of problems for consumers when they're ordering uh, through the e-commerce experience. And we think that this is going to be a better way of doing it. And, and our founder, um, Louis Borders, has a lot of experience here. He actually founded a company called Webvan uh, about 24 years ago uh, that was uh, really successful for a while and then, and then uh, f failed in the end. And one of the reasons that it failed was because of the fulfillment process not being able to keep up with the demand. Mm. So Louis really learned... The, the problem definition back then, he really understood it and it hurt, uh, but he really believes in this vision. And that's why he started HGS Global back in 2013 to really, you know, readdress this problem and get it right this time and beat what's out there. So a combination store is sort of like a Walmart physical store where they, they sell everything. And that's been really successful. And I came to HGS a couple of years ago because I'm excited about our e-commerce opportunity here and just to add to what chris said about that we're planning on offering the customer really high quality goods you, you know if you're ordering using um, any of the online order from your local grocery business how your peaches are picked and your tomatoes are picked you have no clue what you're going to get so a big part of our automated fulfillment is going to include uh, very careful uh, merchandising, picking the goods that we have that come into our facility, that go out to our customers. And because it's purely an e-commerce system, no human shoppers in the building, nothing gets picked over once or twice and left behind for you, the last person to get it. <clears throat> and we'll be able to turn our fresh goods two or three times a day even. This next clip is from the episode with Felix Alvarez, Chief Product Officer at Vibu. He talks about what he sees as the next wave of opportunities and adoptions for food tech and ag tech, and how companies can have an impact from seed to fork. What do you really see as the next wave of opportunities and also adoptions for food tech, robotics within food tech, um, and you obviously touched on agriculture tech as well, uh, ag tech there. Where do you see that going in the next sort of year to three years? Thing is, uh, as the pandemic kind of uh, ended, you ended up with this perfect storm of things getting accelerated. Because at one point in time, uh, probably food tech would have not been something in, you know, a McDonald's radar or a 
Ruth Chris radar, just because uh, to, to think about it. But now with labor shortages and also bottom lines uh, being affected, because automation is right. not solely about the labor, because uh, I think people always kind of associate it with that. No, it's about uh, bottom line growth, efficiency, quality, um, speed, um, yield uh, that you can get when you have a repetitive task uh, that a robot can do at a much faster pace and help the human be able to do more. And that's one of the things that we say, help the human do more, like dishwashing. A dishwasher lasts about 42 days. So right. every 42 days, a dishwasher gets replaced because it's not the most fun work in, in, the, in the back of house of a restaurant. Um, also, if you think about uh, drink drive throughs delivery that now has become a big thing is it's not like the restaurant added additional staff to take about all the digital orders. No, they, they don't. So the problem that you have is how does automation help those restaurants fulfill those orders? Because if you talk to these uh, restaurant operators that tell you I'm leaving 30 to 40% business basically in the cloud because the people makes the order, but I can only fulfill these many. So mm -hmm. automation comes in and actually can help you. Um, even one big brand, Chipotle, has a digital make line. Why? Because they have the front line that works with people coming into the restaurant, but they have so many digital orders that if they didn't make that second make line, they, again, were leaving money on the table. And as you know, Chipotle is one of the QSRs that have the best margins in industry. So that's where I see us kind of like jumping in because first you got to get people to understand how you can get operations at a restaurant uh, to where you can get bottom line growth and that labor shortage that you have that is just keeps increasing uh, to then understand the next thing, which is in, in, in five years, how do you start automating the farm? Uh, logistics because the right now you have automated farm equipment there's plenty of companies working on that you got mm -hmm. big trucks big things that uh you know big tractors that take care of uh harvesting and all that but after that there's still a lot of human labor to pick or in some cases sensitive fruit to packaging to then getting it delivered to then get it inspected to then get it into the restaurant to get it to you so there's still a lot that automation can do. Uh, so we're, we're here for a big journey. Uh, and we always, yeah. we always call it seat to fork. <laughs> Next up is Josh Dyan, VP of engineering at Right Hand Robotics. In this clip, he talks through their approach and how they own the pick. The competitive landscape uh, in warehouse automation and specifically in piece picking is pretty interesting, actually. Um, most uh, of our competition pr may provide one part of the solution just the, the vision system or just the robotic arm or, or just the end effector for grasping. Uh, at RHR, we say we, quote, own the pick, uh, meaning our solution's turnkey. We are the complete picking solution, including the vision system, our patent and gripper, uh, the robotic arm, uh, all the compute, storage, electrical, and pneumatic, everything that powers the system. Uh, of course, all the software, a lot of magic happens in the software um, from firmware and device drivers up through motion control and collision avoidance, um, kinematics, um, multiple machine learning models, all the way up the stack, all the way up to user interfaces and, and analytics dashboards. Uh, but that our approach simplifies life for our customers and for our system integration partners. Um, so, you know, whether it's a partner or a, a customer, they don't need to piece together, pun intended, uh, a picking solution from multiple subcomponent uh, providers. Uh, and if they need support, uh, they work with, with one provider, us. Uh, they don't need to go figure out which subcomponent uh, that uh, a provider to reach out to. This next episode was with a very unique guest. Carl Landrum is the VP of Civilian Programs and Strategy at D-Drone. His background is not from tech companies, which made his insights that much more interesting. He gives us an overview of what they do at D-Drone from someone who used to actually buy their technology for the US government. You know, we, we all know that this space is not cheap. 
So it, it, it is expensive and it is expensive to keep up and that these life cycles, you know, rapidly evolve, which generally mean there's a lot more investment required as time goes on to be able to keep up with the technology. So one of the things at D-Drone that we do not want is we do not want to tell any client, any place, anywhere, you can't use everything you already have. So all of your investment, your, you know, your multi-million dollar investments that you've been putting in year after year after year for the past few years, you know, you cannot use that. that that's something we never want to say. So what I want to, what we do in D-Drone is we're very, very good at sensor fusion is what we're really good at, whether it's our sensor or any other, you know, competitor or partners sensors that are out there. Um, you know, everybody's, you know, trying to work in that particular space and develop products to help, you know, people and companies and governments, you know, around the world. And so what I want to do is I want to be able to pull all of that prior sensor you know, technology that somebody actually possesses, ingest all of that information into our actual sensor fusion and our tracker, you know, our particular C2, you know, D drone tracker ingest all of that information into one particular software stack, utilize, you know, AI, ML to run through all of that data on behalf of the, of the customer. And then on the back end of that, you know, after all the inputs are ingested and all the decisions that need to be made about that information autonomously occur, then provide the customer on the back end particular options are about what they could do about it. So in, in, in broad, you know, over, you know, overview, I want to bring in everybody's sensor data into our sensor fusion capability, be able to make autonomous decisions about that data, present whether or not that is a friend or a foe, you know, whether that thing that is out there is a threat in any kind of way. And if it is a threat, these are, you know, the mitigation capabilities that that particular customer not only has access to, but also has the authority to utilize. So I want to be able to pull all of that data into one single pane of glass for that end user. Because I've been the guy out there in the field. And when you're the guy that's out there in the field and you see something and you need to make, you know, that decision in the next few seconds of what you're going to do about it. You know, you want that to be as easy as possible. So from D drones perspective, if I can make that easy for that individual to be able to do that literally on that laptop or that particular cell phone he's on, that one single pane of glass he's working on where he can see all the data and actually act upon it in one screen. That's what I want to do. And that D drone, that's what we're trying. That's the product we're trying to pull together for really any customer worldwide. In this next clip, Buck Jordan, the founder and CEO at Vibu, shares his vision for the future of the kitchen. First of all, like kind of near term, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for um, for, our, for AI to, to come in and, and really increase the quality consistency of, um, of food that's being prepared. You know, because like all, all this food is being prepared by um, you know, an entry level worker who has had a minimal amount of training. And again, remember, they quit in 42 days or nine months, depending on what kind of what role they're they're in, right? So they never actually get a chance to get really good at things, because they, just, they because in general they, they quit too soon. Um, you know, so so I think that there's that there's an opportunity to kind of use AI to to remove the cognitive load on a lot of these these workers, like tell them what to do when when to do it to make sure quality consistency is is good, and people check them along the way. So there's a lot of really interesting computer vision uh, solutions that are kind of focused on that. Um, and there's a lot of there's a big opportunity for data in the back the back of house, you know, like people, you know, one of our clients gave us this great quote. They said um, our data um, stops at the uh, at the loading dock. In other words, when they receive the food in the back and they pick it up at the POS, the, the, the point of sale system. But they have no idea what happens in between, you know, and so they have to kind of like guess and interpolate. Right. So I think that's going away. I think, I think there's an ability for like kind of data to come out that's actually quite actionable. Um, in a number of areas. Um, and then, you know, but, but I would say that in terms of, uh, big changes to the kitchen space, I think that, um, over the next five, six years, there's going to be, um, companies like Misa Robotics, 
who are taking a cobotics cobotic approach, where, which means humans and robots working together. And you know they'll come in, they'll take out the fryer, they'll take out the drink station, maybe maybe some other other tasks. But humans still working in and around um, the robots. But I think that you know kind of year five or six, you're you're going to start to see a proliferation of um, fully autonomous restaurants. And what does it mean to be fully autonomous, right? So it means your your menu has been sacrificed or designed to be fully autonomous because there's just things some things robots can't do. Like I'm not going to sprinkle that little piece of parsley <laughs> on the thing or, or whatever. Um, but it's worth this. The juice is worth the squeeze because because what do you get when you when you go full auto? That means you don't have to build a very expensive kitchen with permitting and like you still have permitting, but like it's a different kind of thing. You don't have to build like gas and like hoods and like exhaust and you know, what have you. Um, and you don't need to need to manage dozens of people on and off shift. You've got probably got one person who could be from Cisco or some other supplier who comes in, supplies, uh, you know, kind of refreshes the machine in terms of like restocks it and cleans it like once a day. Um, and of course, you know, we're in this delivery era where so much is, is delivered. And so who cares who made it? If you're not going in to enjoy the ambience, like there's always going to be market for like, I want to go and have a nice meal and sit down. Right. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. There's going to be this proliferation of fully autonomous restaurants where, you know, you could have a, um, uh, you know, someone serving a incredible orange chicken in a, in more of like, more like an expanded v, you know, uh, vending machine, <laughs> um, you know, or a kiosk, um, you know, sitting next to a Panda Express and the food coming out of that kiosk will be higher quality, fresher, and it won't have any labor and it won't have um, any real estate costs. So you'll be paying like a more month to month kind of kiosk thing, yeah. not like a five year lease, no tenant improvement. Um, so there, and, and of course that, that vending machine or kiosk, whatever is going to be serving that food at higher quality at half the price. Amazing. And so there's going to be a revolution, I think coming at some point. Now we have Derek Peets, director of automation equipment and test engineering at intuitive. Listen as he talks about lung cancer detection methods and how their robot iron compares to those other methods. It, it blows my mind and it blows my mind that we can even make these things uh, sometimes. Yeah. And it blows my mind like how, uh, I don't know, just not good enough the current state of the art in uh, lung procedure is. Uh, the, the two best methods are one that the uh, you know manually operated bronchoscope that can't reach very far into your lung. So it can only access tumors that are already so large that uh, they might be stage three or stage four uh, tumors where the survival rates are, are awful. Um, or they go from the outside uh, with a larger needle and um, quite often results in uh, a collapsed lung and, and other complications. So you've got one method that uh, kind of works that's dangerous and uh, one method that doesn't really work that great. Uh, and that's all, and it, but it's safe. And what Ion's able to do is access those very distant, very small uh, spots that are that are so hard to access, and um, you know get tissue samples earlier so that uh, there, there's a, a good chance at diagnosing early stage uh, disease. And, and of course, it, it doesn't perform the diagnosis. There's a pathologist involved that, that actually makes that call, but we're able to, to gain access to get the, the the tissue samples. And it's really a combination of technologies that have had to come to converge uh, to be able to make that happen. Uh, you know, there is some of that you know, advanced uh, you know, computer vision and, and machine learning that's used in uh, generating the, the, uh, in the planning software. Uh, that, that's a really uh, core uh, piece of the technology. And then there's the um, kind of the, the key to ION, and you know, we talk about this publicly, is the shape sensing technology. And so this, this catheter, it, it's not just smart in that it can uh, steer itself, uh, which you know, that, that's technology sort of existed for uh, a number of years, but it's actually a device that knows its shape and position down its entire length. And so it can be inserted, driven uh, you know, into the body very, very easily. We produce some like, really amazing uh, UI to enable that to be done uh, very easily. And then can hold its position stably so that the uh, surgeon can go in there and get a sample of whatever they're doing. And even if the, um, if the patient were to move, were to breathe, were to you know shift in some way, it's able to keep focused on the target that you're trying to get that biopsy for. And uh, I just, you know, really, really cool how they, they pulled that all together. This next clip was with Saurav Agarwal, Director of Engineering at Shield AI. He talked about how advancements in technology have helped shape the development of autonomous systems. So I think like when I started out, uh, I got into the field in 2010, 
things were still pretty early. You couldn't get enough compute. You could, so the, the hardware, you know, wasn't there. Deep learning hadn't become popular. So solving computer vision problems was hard. And then basically the, the research was still in its infancy. I mean, the DARPA challenge had happened, but that was all very non-scalable, non-commercializable technology. What I've seen change in the last 10, 12 years is that we have, we now have the compute to build truly autonomous vehicles with compute running at the edge. We now have the science, the, the understanding of, you know, te- techniques like deep learning, which enable us to reason with training on data. You know, that wasn't really easy to do, especially in the computer vision domain. And finally, I think like, there's just been enough time for the engineering work to clear up all the technical debt and robustify the technology to make it commercially ready. Like if you look at self-driving cars, I was in a in a lecture in 2017 and Emilio Frazzoli uh, from MIT, who was actually running, a, his, who actually built his own startup in, in the autonomous vehicle space, said that by 2020, we'll have autonomous cars rolled out. Obviously, that didn't happen, right? It's 2023, and right now it's looking at 2030. So I think like people were, we people were at the peak of their uh, you know hype of uh, excitement, the right. hype curve, right? We went through the the trough of disillusionment, and now we're coming out at the other end where things are more quiet, but actually real work is getting done, and and we'll start seeing these things on the roads in the air. Finally, we have a clip from an awesome episode with Fadi Saad, founder of Cybernetics Ventures. Fadi explained why having founders with strong vertical or market expertise, in addition to technical founders, is an important factor for the investments that they make. I think the technology is important, but having a market understanding, like in a sense, you want to to decide uh, what kind of problems you're trying to solve, what kind of applications you want to look at, and this will eventually lead you to which verticals that you want to focus on. So um, we always, whenever we invest in a, in a company or we look at a company, we always look for vertical expertise on the founding team. Uh, we, we never invest in a pure um, kind of technologist's uh, founding team. Never. Again, this proved not to be successful in robotics uh, when you look at the data over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, having a vertical uh, and a market uh, experience on the founding team proved to be one of the key uh, success factors. So we look at like if you are trying to innovate in the construction space, we it's good to have, I mean, the 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 technologist, uh, the kind of the person that will develop the algorithm and make the designs and select the right technology to do that. But we also looking for someone from the construction space that know what's going on, know who are the players, who are the customers, what's the right business models and pricing kind of models for that. So, and and you can you can see this pattern in in all of our portfolio companies. Uh, Raise Robotics in San Francisco, um, uh, exactly that. A technologist and uh, someone from the construction space, and in specifically the application they're trying to solve, which is the facade uh, installation. Uh, Coazo in Germany, uh, again they had the the technology, but also the experience in construction and scaffolding kind of movement. Um, rugged Robotics uh, in, in Houston, uh, same story, a technologist, a couple of smart folks from MIT, but also they have the construction uh, experience and they worked in construction projects for some time. Mm-hmm.